Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Views from the North. You know, we spend so much time thinking about the South and the East and the West. This is from the North, from Canada. And we're talking today about the housing housing crisis and some potential solution, uh, you know, for it. Uh, some perhaps uh, tiny homes, modular homes, in lieu of tent encampments. Um, there's so many issues, so many places where these issues are coming up. So, um, you know, uh, Ken Rogers has his hands full on this one. Dr. Rogers, uh, would you scope out our discussion? What are we going to talk about? Well, I believe you um, have a variety of solutions for housing. Uh, and some of them are taking roots in lots of different places. For example, uh, for a long period of time, mobile homes have always had a negative stigma, you know, and and yet you'd have um, the concepts in a mobile home um, have gradually improved to where you have a, you know, let's call it a small model mobile home called a park model. And these have to be, in most jurisdictions, under 500 square feet and you know they are quite spectacular in what are is included in this 500 square feet and what the cost can be uh well over time you've also had uh, the mobile home business incorporating things that um have arisen from simple things like a, a camper truck you know, where you have a pickup truck and you stick a box on the back of the pickup truck then somebody goes out fishing or camping and and it's astonishing what you can put in that little wee space and how it works. Somebody can be out for a week or two doing their camping and live out of this camper truck. Uh, well, then you had... Uh, and the fancier version of people had their Winnebago's and they would drive those. Well, gradually you got Winnebago's that now have sides that come fold out or they roll out. And so you have a larger space. Well, over time, then you get the mobile home manufacturers have started to incorporate all kinds of these things. Um, uh, I noticed uh, not too long ago one of the Indian bands or natives in that live in a very remote remote location had a house had problem with housing. They had uh, not enough, and they engaged one of these um, mobile home manufacturing companies to make a a two hundred eighty seven square foot uh, unit. And interestingly, it was about 13 and a half feet high, so it would fit under all the, uh, you know, highway under overpasses. And, uh, <clears throat> but they had um, sleepers, like a, an old train. Uh, when you were riding in a train and you had a sleeper, you know, it kind of folded out up top. Well, well, these are much like the... Um, the Winnebago's and camper truck is this uh, this 287 square foot unit essentially um, had um, uh, you know two bedrooms that were both in a loft type of manner, and they had a simple you know a ladder that uh, instead of uh, taking the space for a stairwell, they had a a ladder that uh, you see in a, a library somewhere, you know, where it hooked on so it was nice and safe, but you could go up at a slope rather than straight up and down. And uh, and so you had this space. Well, um, what I feel, one of the things with the housing is... Let me, let me uh, before you go on to that, let me, let me just mention that there was a movie now, a couple of years ago. I think it won some awards. And it was about um, people who live in communities of these trailers in the Southwest, particularly, but in other places too. And, and they get together in the middle of nowhere 
um, and they, they gather and they all bring their trailers together and they talk to each other. And it's a circuit. It's a circuit where they go from one encampment to another encampment. And the, the movie portrayed them as, um, you know, lower middle. They didn't have any money, most of them. Um, but they wanted the outdoors. They wanted to get away from the manic crowd. Um, and for that reason, they they joined these communities, these encampments. It was a it was a whole broad community of encampments. They all knew each other from one encampment to another. And and I mention this because I think that some people are going to buy the Winnebagos and go travel around the country, um, and it's an escape. It's a holiday. Other people um, are going to look for the outdoors and want the the community that was in this movie. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a good movie, and it portrayed the, the personalities, which was the more, more, more important part of the movie. But what I'm saying is that we have not focused on this movie, focused on. We have not focused on the fact that we have an alternative lifestyle out there of people who don't want to or who cannot afford housing. And so they get these trailers. And this is the way it's going to be, not for this week or for the summer, but forever for them. Well, that exists right now at a fairly good scale in Los Angeles. You know, is that uh, there are a lot of people living in their vehicles and they simply move the vehicles around from place to place uh, because the, you know, authorities want to shoo them out and the neighborhood in which they choose to park, uh, get tired of them pretty quickly or uh, and try to m get them out. For example, um, uh, my oldest son, re you know, recently moved out of Los Angeles from a neighborhood where one of his concerns was the neighborhood was going downhill because it became one of the areas where these um, caravans of people uh, chose to park. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, what, what do you have? That's just another, in my view, maybe not 100%, but substantially, in my view, that is another expression of homelessness. A lot of them do not have the choice. And so what we have here is homelessness, houselessness, um, all over this country. That did not exist 20 years ago. Not, not in these numbers. And then you look at Europe and you find the same thing. I don't think it exists so much in Asia because the, the governments in Asia are, you know, they're not going to commit that. Um, but what we have is, uh, at, we, we do have a lot of homeless people in Hawaii, thousands of them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that it's not just that we have failed to do these, um, you know, cosmetic changes or give them money or, or buy houses or rent houses to them or establish, you know, real house communities is that we have an economic problem. You're into economics. There's something wrong here. Uh, how would you cast this from a, a, an economist point of view? Well, I would think that uh, the young generations in the United States and Canada, uh, expect too much. Um, I, I'll use an example. Uh, one of the uh, major areas in the city of Calgary, uh, the northeast area, um, <clears throat> started off at a you know modest uh, cost area compared to other areas of the city. Well, uh, Canada's had, and Calgary in particular, has had a huge amount of immigration from uh, Asia, particularly uh, the Middle East and, and India, Pakistan. And the housing in this area has gone at a, at a bit of a premium, you know, and, and I was curious, what, what was this premium or how did that arise? And what it is, is, is these Asian groups, um, particularly ones from the Middle East, they buy a house and will be, will pay more for it than than anybody else, uh, but you get ten of them or twelve of them living in the house, you know. They, they and 
And I, when I thought about it, one of the um, interesting things in the Okanagan was a similar phenomenon is, is when the um, um, uh, people moved from the Punjab into the Okanagan and they were really good at, uh, at farming and that uh, they would buy an orchard, but they would have, you know, a dozen people living in the house, all contributing income. And pretty soon, you know, when you have a household that with a lot of people all producing something, it's not too long before you can afford to buy the piece of land next door and repeat the process. Um, where a typical Canadian would say, well, gee, you can't possibly have, you know, a seven-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son sharing the same bedroom. You know, like that, you know, and I think of when I grew up uh, on what I call the the tougher side of the tracks, uh, I can remember that uh, my um, two sisters and my brother and I all shared a bedroom which had two, two bunk beds, uh, one against each side of the room, and uh, the aisle between the two bunk beds was uh, was skinnier than the width of the bed you know so it was really about an eight foot wide room with you know two three foot bunk beds and about two feet in between but the length of the room was uh, was only about a foot longer than the bunk beds you know and and uh, we thought uh, when we moved to a house the first time I'd ever lived in a, <laughs> in a single family home was 699 square feet and we thought it was paradise you know and and my bro and it had a uh, 699 square feet with a with a full uh, basement now the basement was empty other than with the furnace and you know my brother and I had a bed in the basement floor till you know took a year or two for my father built a bedroom there so there, there's really a question of the standard that people are expecting, you know the, uh, you know, uh, you know this. My example of this uh, earlier, the uh, native band buying the a uh, whole bunch of these um, mobile homes that were uh, 287 square feet with the with the lofts. Um, you know, they had a version that was, uh, you know, three bedroom and it wasn't much bigger, but these were, you know, in, in U.S. dollars, it'd be like $50,000. And you can, you can go on Amazon and, uh, and you can buy a, a house using the technology that uh, the Winnebag the rich Winnebago's created where the house, you can, it comes um, by freight or by, you know, 18 wheeler and, uh, and yet it's like, you know, eight or 10 feet wide, but the house folds out. Now, well, that, that, takes, that takes us to this whole movement. I'll call it a movement because I think it's all over. First, the first thing we saw was tiny houses where architects and contractors were designing houses that were really, really, really small. And the notion was it would be really, really cheap. And uh, you could, you know, build a lot of them for not too much money, and you could use them for homeless or, or you know, people who wanted um, who wanted to, to find a house that was small. They figured they could live in a small house. That was the first time it it popped up. <clears throat> More recently, you know, um, she was um, Elon Musk uh, designed a house uh, that he could ship to your your lot. And uh, it was a sort of a prefabricated, fold-out kind of house. It wasn't it wasn't that that small, but it was still small. And uh, in a day, you could set it up, and it would be a pretty workable house. And it has a price on it. I don't remember the price, but the price was like uh, ten thousand dollars, I think, not very expensive. And uh, it was all set up, and all you had to do was connect the plumbing, the electricity, and so forth. And, and and he had plenty of press on that. I don't know where that went or what you know what, what which part of his empire he was using to design it and 
and uh, manufacture it and uh, distribute it. Now, more recently, and this is really a surprise, somebody sent me an email um, with um, a page out of uh, Amazon. And uh, my goodness gracious, here's a house on Amazon. You can buy a house on Amazon. And this house is going to cost you somewhere between $10,000 and $12,000 or $13,000. You know, but $10,000 is a simple version. And uh, you want the premier version, it's going to cost you two or $3,000 more. Quite amazing. And this house comes to you, and I'm not kidding, in a cardboard box with a swoosh on the side, Amazon logo on the side, and it's delivered to your lot. And um, you know, with, a, with a box cutter, you can uh, take, take the cardboard off. And with a screwdriver, you can take all the, you know, the sides and put them together again. And like the Elon Musk house, you've got to connect it with, uh, um, you know, plumbing and electricity and what have you. And then presto, for roughly ten thousand dollars, you can have a, you know, a workable house. This is not a trailer, this is not a truck, this is not movable, but it is cheap. Okay, and and I think that that's where we're going. At. Let me add one other uh, possibility. A few years ago, um, all the rage. Uh, and it began in Russia, my unfavorite country, um, with um, uh, some kind of uh, concrete mix, and it was a it was a printed house, a printed house, so that uh, it, at a given spot, right in the center where this house was going to be, there would be uh, a, a concrete pipe, and the pipe would be uh, directed by a computer program. And it would drop concrete in certain places, and uh, and you just let it go, just let it do its thing, and 24 hours later, you had a concrete house. Um, and this was actually being done. I think this is being done in Europe, uh, and it's another possibility for a modular house um, that's cheap and that doesn't require labor or union labor, uh, except to hook it up. So I, I, I say movement because I think all of these things are really part of, of a movement. Uh, do you agree that this movement has legs? Is this going somewhere? Uh, not quickly. <laughs> uh, but yes, eventually. Like one of the key problems is, is um, all of the regulations regarding housing and the general concept of the public, not in my backyard. Uh, for example, uh, a mobile home park, a normal mobile home park where there's, you know, fairly good size mobile homes roll in, you know, and a lot of them even double wide. Uh, the technology's there to get those and deliver them at a pretty good price, but, but Nobody wants a mobile home park in their neighborhood, and you have major problems with city zoning. They don't allow them. Uh, well, one of the uh, things that this uh, new premier in British Columbia has, has brought in is, um, is how about every, everybody in all of these new old neighborhoods, uh, why not have... Um, change the zoning so that you can have up to four in some cases and six in others uh, dwelling units on an individual lot you know well the simplest idea was uh, was these pre-manufactured units that somebody would call you know we don't want a mobile home but if you dress it up a little bit and it's not much bigger than a single car garage you know, and you stick that in your backyard and you can rent it for $1,000 a month and it costs you, you know, less than $50,000. Well, that's pretty good rate of return if you're renting it. <laughs> you know, and uh, and so the um, activity in, um, example, the city I live in with these, um, you know, second and third extra dwelling unit on a single lot and in many cases and knock down the 1950 standard subdivision house that might have been uh, you know below what 
young couples think is a, is a reasonable size house nowadays, you know, which I think is one of the key problems is, is they got to, you know, come around to the economic reality. Um, but these, uh, you know, knock down a 900 square foot bungalow and put, you know, four to six dwelling units on that uh, unit, uh, on that piece of land. You know, if it's a corner lot, it's kind of easy to put about ha about six dwelling units on it, all of which are fully separate, just like a row house. You know, uh, this all reminds me of Singapore. <clears throat> In Singapore, if you uh, emigrate to Singapore, um, A, you got to have a job, and they'll give you a job. They'll, they'll find something for you. And B, you got to have a house and they will take part of your pay from the job and you can actually buy the house. You're invested in a house the day you arrive. It's, it's really remarkable. Uh, furthermore, in Singapore, if you have an old building that's, you know, getting rotten, you have to tear it down and you have to rebuild it. Uh, I don't know the, you know, the entrepreneurial aspect to that. But the fact is, there are no real old buildings, unless you have some kind of uh, license from the government to keep it as a historic building. Um, you got to tear it down. You can't can't keep it forever. And this is good. It's renewal. It's like the cars in Singapore. If your car is more than X years old, you can't use it anymore. Won't be licensed. You got to get a newer car. So it's this whole notion of renewal, renewal, renewable, renewable housing. And I think that feeds into a solution. Now, you mentioned, Ken, that, you know, the government was involved. And I feel that, you know, this is a, a huge social problem. Um, my own theory about it is that uh, the economies of the countries where you find homeless um, don't work. Uh, the, the cost of occupancy, the cost of land is too expensive. Um, and uh, nobody's regulated the cost of occupancy and the cost of and New well, York used to have New York used to have rent control. I don't, I'm not sure that it still does. So so that uh, you know, landlords so you know uh, wouldn't be able to take advantage for old building. Suffice to say that if you have a social problem that is systemic in a in a province, a state, uh, in a city, in a country, um, you've got to get the government involved. It, it's not in the Jubri, It's not a matter of Capital capitalism solving the problem for the disadvantage. The government must be involved as a matter of humanity, as a matter of equity. What do you think? Well, that's correct. Now, Singapore has a great advantage. It only has one level of government. You know, you don't have, you know, a city government, a metropolitan area, you know, metro government then a state or provincial government, and then a federal government. Uh, and the Singapore housing, <clears throat> the first item was that uh, new immigrant into Singapore get, with the job and the housing has a zero down payment. Well, it's illegal in Canada and the U.S. to have zero down payment. You know, like, like capitalism couldn't do it if they wanted to. You know, you, uh, you know, the all of the banks have regulations as to, you know, you shall have no mortgage that's greater than seventy five percent of the value of the housing, unless it's a guaranteed mortgage, and then it still might only be eighty five or ninety percent, and 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 really. Uh, your point of having the governments work together and do the things properly, you do need uh, the ability to solve down payments. Young people have pretty good incomes. They can make monthly payments, but they sure can't dig up the down payment. That's where, you know, all the baby boomers and, and people, you and I, that were born during the war or the late part of the Depression, um, you know, what what's the standard first thing in family conversations? How much did each of your kids need in subsidy to help them get their first housing? You know, and, and even when they're they're upgrading, they're still having trouble with the down payments. 
So, so that, you know, that's a, a first area of solution is, is really the financing. Uh, well, you know, some of the housing stuff is a, is a tougher crisis. Like the city I live in has, has a project right now. Uh, I went and tried to take some photos of it, um, where it was trying to replace the, one of the tent cities. Like we have these, you know, tent encampments and, uh, you know, the weather here is not too terrific in the winter for somebody living in a tent. You know, it, it's almost inhumane that, that you'd have that. And, and so that the city by itself, uh, took a piece of land that it owned in a, in the middle of an industrial area and, uh, bought these, um, uh, little units, uh, which were, uh, let's see, they have, a a bathroom and a, and sleeping accommodation and, and a little bit of room. Think of about 70 square feet, you know, like think of an eight by eight room or, you know, a 10 by six room kind of thing or 10 by seven. And that's it. Well, they, these things were just pre-manufactured. They rolled them out and stuck them on a property where they had another building in which, you know, there was common, common things, you know, that other things that they could go uh, almost like it was, you know, uh, you know, a, um, you know, a better than a, like a retirement home, a senior oh. facility, uh, a <clears throat> community. Community. Yeah, but it was it was an effort to to reduce the uh, you know tent encampments, especially anyone near any businesses. You know that. Well, I think I think you've hit on a really important point. Um, if you can get people and um, to go into a facility like that, then there are rules and there are benefits in being there, and there there's a community that will enforce the rules and provide the benefits and. Um, it's like, uh, and it's, it's, it's social benefits as well as, you know, economic benefits. So, um, that's what we're missing. We don't have that anymore. When you, when you have all these homeless people, they're not connected to anybody, anything. On the other hand, let me say that we're developing an alternative society of people in the trailers, um, people on the streets, people who for years and years and years find a way to live without homes, without housing. And this is a problem because it's hard to wean them off the street. They may not like the idea of being subject to rules and being part of a community and, you know, being cared for and taking care of others, being a, a neighbor, if you will. And so I think the longer we let people live on the streets, the more difficult it is to bring them in, to bring them back. Um, and, and for that reason, I think the government must act in broad strokes. And the government, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a carrot stick thing. A, you can't be on the street, like in so many places in Asia. Uh, and B, um, we'll make it worthwhile for you to come in and be part of this community and take one of the properties that we, you know, we use to create an, a, arguably a home for you. Um, but the government's not doing that. Uh, a lot of what the government does is, uh, you know, A, it's, uh, it's inefficient. That goes without saying. <clears throat> but, but B, it's cosmetic. And it doesn't really reach the problem. To me, the problem is always an economic problem if you have disparity this way. So <clears throat> if the government is going to do something, it has to act in large, in large statements. And that means for Canada... I think it should be federal. And for the U.S., I think it should be federal. I think there should be a consistency. So you don't have one city way better than the other city and one set of rules that are way different. Uh, and I think there are common denominator solutions that could apply across the board. But we, we don't do that. And the reason is that homeless people, they don't vote so much. And they don't make campaign contributions. <laughs> and nobody cares about them, really. And it's all it's like this humane thing where the legislature or the governor is trying to 
um, make it less of an eyesore for the others, for the middle class and the upper middle class. Nobody wants a blue tent on his backyard. Um, and so... Uh, blue it, fort on his main street. Yeah, right. So, so I mean, th and that's not much of a motivation, honestly. <clears throat> you have got to actually put the money in. We are going to solve this problem until we do systemic reform on the price of occupancy and um, carrot stick on the, on the on the method of getting people back into the community. You know, if they're if they're living on the street, they're probably not working, and if they're not working, they're at, at best a drag on the economy and at worst, uh, you know, a negative feature in the economy and in the society. I mean, this is really a serious problem. You know, in writing up the show, you called it a crisis. Well, it certainly is a crisis, and it's all it's, it's likely to get worse until somebody steps in. And so many of the steps taken, including here in Hawaii, are purely cosmetic. Let's throw a little money at this. Um, well, it's not going to solve it. Um, if you were going to be heavy-handed, uh, you could solve certain things pretty quickly in terms of the homeless on the street is you've got the drugs and let's call it drug addiction, alcohol addiction or a combination and mental illness. Well, if you have government funded facilities to handle each of those, you know, you have a, you know, let's call it a, not a mental hospital, but uh, a mental home and you build a special purpose facility. You got to have all the government financing to put it together. You got to have the government financing the people that run it. Well, then you're going to have to be heavy handed and pick up the people on the street. You know, when they, you know, say, we won't let you have your tent here. We won't let you have it there. We won't let you have it anywhere, but here's a room. You can have it in this facility. You know, at some point you got to get gathered them up, whether it's against their will or not, um, for the uh, general public good and for actually the good of the person involved. Uh, you've got an awful lot of um, entities like the Salvation Army that stand on their head to help uh, people. You know, they have these shelters where they come in only at night to sleep, but, uh, you know, and they also have ones where they serve meals. Uh, but how do you get government financing to facilitate so the Sally Ann can do twice as much? Well, I, you know, um, Sally Ann, that's cute. Um, now, it, it seems to me that uh, I don't want projects. As you know, the Chicago projects are no place anybody wants to live. Um, I, I would like to set up a, uh, a system uh, where um, entrepreneurs, investors, um, are, uh, you know, uh, they're encouraged, they're incentivized um, to build these projects you're talking about. And, uh, and so, um, and well, likewise, that, that, likewise, nonprofits, nonprofits could also be incentivized. Well, that lane housing or backyard housing project or system in British Columbia is exactly that, you know, but instead of being, you know, your super entrepreneur like an Elon Musk or, you know, lesser scale versions of, you know, major real estate developers or something. Just this is Joe Schmo with his single family house that's, uh, you know, at retirement age and could use the extra income or is not, doesn't have a garden as big as the size of the backyard as kids are gone uh, and they could use the income. Uh, you know, the, that it's a real use of, of that, but I agree with you exactly is, is capitalism is a, is a magic method of accomplishing things as long as the rules steer it in the right way. Yes. Uh, Pam, yeah, let, let me add to that, uh, the government has to be involved, uh, in getting them out of this house. You know, we talk, and, and governments usually talk in terms of we're going to get them in the housing and we're going to let them stay. We're going to encourage them to stay forever. No, it shouldn't be forever. It should, it should be a bridge to somewhere else. 
it'd be a bridge for, you know, you have the people go out and get good jobs and then they can afford their own house and so forth. So you have to provide this along the whole spectrum of housing. So, so the next level, if you will, um, after the tiny house, after the project house is available and it's not that expensive and they could become middle class and they can live in a middle class neighborhood. So the idea of just building housing, putting them in the housing and letting them stay there forever, bad idea. There has to be a dynamic for this, don't you think? Yes. I agree with you fully. I, I was expecting you to continue for a little well, well, there, but well, I think this is this could be done by incentivization, tax incentivization with entrepreneurs, and somebody would have to sit in a room and figure out how we're going to solve the crisis because crises have a way of perpetuating themselves, and in this case, the crisis crises are so broad and so deep and so related to you know essential elements of our economy, our system, if you will. Um, that 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 we really must end to it. I don't think the governments, well, for that matter, people who vote in governments and participate as government officials, you know, understand how corrosive this is. Let me pass to one other thing that's kind of related, and that is here in Hawaii, if you want to get a permit on a new house, it takes you years. And there's no bloody reason for that, except, you know, they don't want to work, you guys, in in the planning and permitting department, they don't want to work, or maybe they want to have special special rates. You know, if you want an expedited treatment of the permit, you know, you could pay extra. Uh, what is that about? Why should it be expedited rates? What's that for? Who's benefiting? Who's who's has to pay this? If you're not rich, you can't have an expedited rate. That's ridiculous. And then to find that planning and permitting are they're taking cash in envelopes in the way of bribes, that is outrageous. So you have the delay of the permitting, you have the inequity of special rates, and, and then you have bribery on top of all of that. How can you build a community for homeless people, for anybody with that? You know, I'm, I don't think they let that happen in Singapore. I think the penalties would be really, really, really stiff, but we don't do that. Well, well, I thought Hawaii had talented lawyers. <laughs> hey, you know, I know I, I'm saying that facetious, facetiously since I know uh, you're a lawyer, uh, and, or you were at one time, you practiced law, uh, law. But I think, you know, the best example in the United States of, of giving free enterprise a hand is, is Nevada. You know, Nevada has less rules and less problems. Now, Nevada is not without, you know, some corrupt things. But generally, you know, free enterprise is pretty freewheeling there. And, and in my mind, there's, there's almost no industry certainly not with the number uh, and that the real estate development and your industry has is is entrepreneurial skill you know if you give you know carrots and sticks really really will work for anything to do with housing and development um well you've got to get your planning authorities out of the way well this is this new premier in British Columbia, he's basically, you know, stomping on on all of the municipal planning and subdivision authorities. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, this provincial program will only work if you in these cities. And, and you say, well, why didn't you come my city? Well, we don't like how long it takes you to get a building permit. Fair enough. Or, or you know, it's really just just pretty strong... Uh, will provincial government, they're doing it without much help from the feds. You know, they keep trying to get federal help, but of course it's a different party. You know, it's like the, you know, the state being a Republican and the fed being a Democrat, you know, or the equivalent. Um, and they don't want to cooperate too much because there might be another election somewhere. Well, speaking of politics, you, you have to factor in the unions. Because the unions have political moments here, lots of influence. The unions want to build it 
slowly, tediously using old systems. The unions don't want to accept new technologies. I'm sure the unions are not happy about tiny houses or modular housing or houses that come in a box from Amazon. Um, they want to take their time. They don't want to use the technology. But I think technologies, you know, in this governmental effort we talk about, um, this emergency effort, one of the things is to respect, um, identify, and deploy the newest technology. For example, uh, in Hawaii, we have a thousand people from the fire in Maui. They're still in hotel rooms. And it's a temporary situation, but it's been a while. Um, and at the same time, we have a thousand units out there that are not they are not being rented to them. So for whatever reason, whether it's vacation rentals or people asking for too much money for, you know, taking advantage of the situation. Um, bottom line is that we have to have technology that matches the supply and the demand. So if, if I need a house or should need a house, I should be able to go on a website and have any number of choices of houses. And if I'm uh, a landlord and I want to rent the house, uh, I should have a website that will uh, you know, reach out into the marketplace and help me select tenants, good tenants. Not tenants from hell, but good tenants. And so I don't think we're using that. I don't think we're using the modular technology. Uh, I think the unions are standing in the way, and government, is, government has a problem understanding technology. It has got to adopt every kind of technology, you know, in terms of rentals and, um, and, and construction. Um, you know, the federal government in this country is not so limited uh, that they have to abide by local politics so much or abide by local unions. And, and, they, and, they, and they have better, better results, better techniques in construction, better equipment. Um, and so that's what, we've got to get on that. And we've got to make sure that the politics and the anti-technology uh, influence doesn't get in the way. I um, don't see that same problem with unions in British Columbia, and we have a pretty unionized province. Uh, and and I uh, question your your idea of technology and and where technology can come into the housing area. You know, one example where I think technology is important is the evolution of heat pumps. You know, so you can have a a pretty simple heat pump that uh, you know an air air heat pump or air intake heat pump where it does both the heating and the air conditioning and you don't need any ducts in the house. Now, there's a major, major cost saving in terms of the capital cost and the operating cost. Now, tell me other technology that you're going to apply to the housing that a 21-year-old new housewife would consider you know, part of her house. You know, well, I mean, in Hawaii, you have you have it gets hot, okay, and you have to have building materials that will ameliorate that. You have to have architectural designs that will let the air flow through. Um, and new housing, you know, often the architects will adopt these systems, but sometimes not. And in the sky, you know, the big big skyscraper condo buildings, um, which should be used like they are in Singapore. Um, you know, for homeless people, for people who can't afford real expensive uh, housing, they should be there. Um, and if you talk to an architect who studies engineering and who cares about this, you will find a, a certain level of frustration um, because it, these systems are not being adopted. But let me say that the material science is very valuable. Architectural designs for airflow, very valuable. And you could take a house... Um, that is would be very hot using traditional methods, and you can make it much cooler. That's correct. But you you didn't uh, answer my question. You you know strongly said you know there ought to be more technology applied to solve the housing problem. And I would say, what are you talking about? There's a, there's no technology out there that isn't being applied. Housing is a very, very difficult thing to uh, bring technology 
to bear on. I mean, the if you're building something in a factory, it's more efficient than if you're building it out on the street, you know, to some extent. But if you took a, a simple row house project, if it's large enough, it's basically like inside a factory anyhow. And housing, if you think of, of the mechanical parts of a, of a housing unit, you know, you can't have a, a ordinary wall and say, well, everybody can have a, a simple wall. Well, how do you get the electric wiring there? And how do you get the plumbing? Like if you build the wall as a separate piece, well, how do you connect, you know, the the water pipe or the sewer pipe or the electric wiring to that wall? And gee, and it's got to connect to a floor and it's got a, a ceiling light. Um, and so you've got a, a process. Now, the government requires that to put in electrical, you need to have an electrical certification. And you need a plumbing certification, and you need a heating certification, you know. And when you get certifications, you get unions, you know. And unions, I think unions are great things. You know, well, why? Well, why don't you use? Why don't you use common plans? Why don't you have a? You know, this community is going to have this kind of house, and here's the, the common denominators, and it's all pre-certified. It's all pre-approved. Why do you have to go house by house months at a time just getting approval if you can say, here, we have 100 houses. Um, it's all going to be the same and, you know, plumbing, electrical, what have you, it's going to be the same. So how about putting a stamp on it? Um, but we don't do that. We go what house by house. What do you mean? Uh, my brother and I did that 40 years ago. But we, we, you know, we built the same unit probably, you know, 500 times, you know, and, you know, you'd take, you know, you may do them in projects, you know, the, but we started with little wee projects, you know, like five or six units and then eight units or 10 units. But, you know, and, and, you know, you put it, pass it through the city hall and, you know, that it's the same unit with the same plan, the same, you know, you don't need a get a whole bunch of recertifications of things, you've already got them. Um, and, and like the development industry can adapt to whatever the rules are. Just give them a bloody chance and they will perform. Give them a chance, um, take the obstacles away, uh, take uh, people who don't want to use the technology away, uh, people who take bribes, you want them away. Um, and ultimately, and I don't know, this probably doesn't exist in you know, British Columbia, but um, the, the land, the land is simply too expensive. And, that, and, and the cost of the land is passed on right down to the rent. Um, and so you got to find a way to do land reform if you want people in a city to be able to uh, ad afford reasonable housing. And reasonable housing is like, it's like the framework of their lives. It's like the framework of the economy. You know, they, they used to say, uh, you know, uh, so, so as, as Detroit goes, as General Motors goes, so goes the nation. And then they used to say, well, as cheap energy, you know, renewable energy goes, so goes the nation. And now I would say, as the cost of housing goes, so goes the nation. You could quote me, Ken. Oh. <laughs> Well, you have to slow down your immigration, you know, and, and U.S. immigration is is way, way less proportionally than, than Canada has, and that's a major problem with our housing. You know, it also, in particular, students, you know, they come with a, you know, you seem to be able to get into Canada or the United States on a student visa pretty easily, you know, well, then... You know, in Canada, they, we've recently found that, uh, gee, they come on a student visa and they're only taking one course, you know, and they've got a job. And, you know, five years later, somebody says, gee, they're still on a student visa or they forget about it and they never follow up. 
Uh, however, uh, the uh, housing crisis doesn't stand alone. Uh, you have to solve the mental illness, the drug stuff for at the lowest end, and you also have to have a way of solving the down payments for for young people. Uh, and I think Singapore's example is a great one. You know, like you get, you know, you could pick college graduates, start with them because they're the most capable and probably smart enough to understand it. We'll let you get a, a zero down payment house if you have a job out of university and and a b c d or whatever you know oh you got to connect all the dots and uh, i totally agree with you about that we got to go now ken we're we're uh, in, in, uh we're out of time but uh, let's continue this let's I, I would like to discuss with you our relative immigration rules and regulations uh, at some point in time, and I'm looking forward to that. Dr. Ken Rogers, retired businessman, entrepreneur um, in uh, at Kelowna, British Columbia, joins us to discuss the view from the North. Thank you so much, Ken. Aloha from Canada. No. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>